It would be difficult to overstate how prominent Hamilton was in the lead up to the 2016 election. I was living in New York City for college at the time I felt its meteoric rise from 2015 to 2016. It was the twilight of the Obama administration, and I remember watching the apotheosis of two distinct sets of politics, hinging on a burgeoning civil rights movement, dozens of culture wars of varying lengths and intensities, and a pop culture market realigning to serve groups of people previously not pandered to. And with the rise of Donald Trump's candidacy and eventual win, the self-identified progressives around me could not stop talking about this musical. One of my roommates even had the soundtrack disc pack prominently displayed on her desk. And it makes a lot of sense in retrospect, why that, why then? It was a time when many of us were trying to reconcile all the Obama administration had promised and failed to accomplish, and the legacy it would leave behind. When simultaneously, there was a stoking of racist and anti-immigrant sentiment, threatening our pride as Americans. In the midst of this, a story of the American Revolution, of the value of standing behind your principles, fighting for what you believe in, was in essence exactly the salve many liberals were looking for. Not to mention, it was all to the tune of what people like me who know nothing about hip-hop would call modern hip-hop, and told by a diverse cast of people of color playing our founding fathers. It also didn't hurt that the musical was, according to my musical friends, a genuine breath of fresh air on the musical scene, trying something sincerely different. And boy, was it sincere. Now, full disclosure, until these past couple of months, I had not listened to one track of Hamilton. I'm always like a good 10 steps behind most cultural properties, and I'm not 100% sure what made me want to look at Hamilton now. Maybe I finally just got too curious after hearing people talk about it all those years ago. Or maybe it's just because looking at increasingly silly things to judge people for is the only way I can feel anything anymore. Or maybe it's just because I saw it would be available to stream on Disney Plus and just decided to go for it. Regardless, I was struck for the first time with a motivation to listen to Hamilton. In leftist circles, there is no shortage of hate and derision toward Hamilton. People who I talked to in preparing for this video who are less online than me and specifically less aware of the online left tended to be kind of surprised by this. And it was baffling to pretty much everyone involved, like being transported back to 2014 and making a joke at Nickelback's expense and someone responding really earnestly like, I love Photograph. For a lot of people, the fact of the casting alone, even if they're not really aware of what the musical is about, seems like a pretty solid indication it should be something the left, broadly speaking, should be in favor of. Combine that with the actual emphasis the musical places on things like hardworking immigrants and occasionally making vaguely feminist or anti-racist, or at least anti-slavery, points, and the musical seems to have at least some kind of left-of-center bent to it. And yet, leftists don't like Hamilton. In fact, it makes a lot of leftists, even ones who haven't seen it, just mad. And exactly why that is gets to the heart of some of the fundamental differences between a leftist reading of American history and a liberal one. So for this video, I'm going to start off by talking about how different framings of American history serve to justify our modern political system for different groups. Then I'm going to talk a little about American history in the United States. Next, I'll introduce some less emphasized historical context. And finally, I'm going to actually talk about Hamilton. You'll see numbers appear in the upper left corner as I speak. These refer to sources that can be found in the description. Let's get into it. <laughs> Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. I'm hoping it's not controversial of me to say, but in America, discussions about our history tend to be framed in a basically positive light. Now, this does vary in degree. Conservatives will tend to be less critical of American history, and they will criticize what they perceive to be liberals being destructively critical of American history. Whereas liberals will criticize particular facets of the history, especially those having to do with historical bigotry and oppression. But broadly speaking, you'll find politicians on both sides of the aisle calling back to American history or American founding values. Liberals will wave the constitution around and wax poetic about its genius, and conservatives will hand ring about what the founding fathers would think. To this end, conservatives and liberals alike frame American history in such a way to make it palatable to their particular ways of thinking. This makes sense. History is a particularly useful tool for ideology. For one thing, a nation maintaining a basically positive view of its own history is an easy way to justify its modern actions. After all, if the United States has always had good values and always done good things, 
it's pretty fair to assume it's still good. This is one of the reasons the way history is taught is such an important issue to conservatives. They believe if history is not properly framed, it'll cause people to become too critical of America, thus undermining patriotism and ultimately the justifications of our foreign policy, and even the foundations of our government. Additionally, history can make for a useful tool to justify the status quo. If a system fails to deliver on its promises, political leaders and media can fall back on founding values to indicate the inherent good of the system they created. The Electoral College may not deliver election results in line with what the majority of people actually want, but any time it's questioned, we're reminded that the Founding Fathers, in their wisdom, designed it to prevent tyranny of the majority. Though of course it's not questioned whether it's better that a well-organized fringe minority have control, or clarified exactly what majority James Madison was so worried about when he wrote Federalist 10. There are notable differences in the general trends of how people of different political persuasions view and frame American history. Conservatives, for instance, emphasize American military might on the world stage, especially during the World Wars, and choose to emphasize American values such as freedom, individualism, and other free market and military values. They also point to the infallibility of the Founding Fathers as necessary to forward their constructionist view of the Constitution, that it is an infallible document we should seek to interpret, not change. Liberals, on the other hand, are more likely to emphasize American values such as liberty and equality, and in their image tend to call upon a vision of a young, well, scrappy America, and a group of framers of the Constitution doing their best despite their flaws to create a country based on these values. Neither of these framings is exclusive to one side, but this is the general tendency I've noticed. The way that conservatives use and talk about history is undoubtedly harmful and serves their particular interests. But it's not the focus of this video, and you can get that material from any number of videos debunking PragerU classes on American history. I want to focus on the more pernicious way liberals use history. Any non-Americans watching this will have likely already identified that I'm using more or less the definition of liberalism used in America. Thought to be a generally left-leaning ideology that endorses civil rights and a regulated market economy. But I think some of the points here will make more sense if I'm more clear about how I'm using it. American liberalism, as I'm using it, refers to a justifying ideology for capitalism, which can include civil rights and reform measures to address issues especially of race, gender, sexuality, and sometimes but usually not disability, while leaving the actual systems at work mostly unaffected. American liberalism, in a nutshell, is the idea that the solution to the issue of a cabal of white straight men running everything is to make sure some proportion of these people are black or female or LGBT. And to clarify, this can lead to some improvements in the lives of these disenfranchised groups. Women in higher positions at some companies have led to the definite wins of maternity leave, breastfeeding rooms, and pregnancy parking for women in the professional class. Minorities of all kinds in positions of power are in theory able to advocate for people like them, though this seems to not happen as much as was once expected. But this does little for members of these groups who are poor or vulnerable and don't have access to the benefits of these professional and elite spaces, and certainly doesn't alleviate the negative impacts of those companies. It's probably occurred to you, given the topic of this section, that using American history to endorse their politics might run into some conflicts for liberals. For conservatives, things like slavery only pose so much of a problem when significant portions of their base still actively wave the Confederate flag and so many of them believe that being in the party of Lincoln allows them to wholly wash their hands of the whole slavery thing. Liberals have to be a little more careful in which founding fathers they use to promote their beliefs and how. Thomas Jefferson, for instance, has become pretty toxic in the past few years as more and more people come to see him as a despicable slave rapist. Likewise, the tendency among men who in theory advocated for liberty and justice for all to have owned slaves, and in some cases went through quite some trouble to keep them as times changed, seems hypocritical, a thing liberals really, really hate. Not to mention the fact that for the first couple of hundred years, the majority of modern Democrats' voter base would not have been able to vote. To continue using the imagery and mythos of the American Revolution politically, and to some degree even to justify their continued glorification of our foundational ruling documents without alienating their base, required alternative framings of that history. The basic form of this that has been standard for as long as I can remember is a kind of pragmatic recognition of the flaws of the Founding Fathers while recognizing the genius of their political designs. 
This framing relies on what is considered a sensible reading of history, where we acknowledge that things were different then, maybe imply that were these great men given the benefit of being born at a different time, they would have been against these institutions, and in particular focusing on this idea that while the Founding Fathers were imperfect, they recognized in their wisdom that the world of tomorrow may look very different from their own, and they created a living constitution that we could change to work with changing times. This way of viewing hashtag problematic historical figures in their context is often set up to counter the, in my opinion, definitely questionable idea that it is a useful exercise to critique historical figures using modern morality and political norms, and comes from an, in my opinion, quite silly notion that we need to protect these figures from cancellation by overzealous youths. I'm going to return to this point about viewing the Founding Fathers in their historical context in a later section, but for now, I just want you to mull over this. Whether you believe or not that it is useful to morally condemn these people on the basis of their racism and sexism, do you think it's likely that their beliefs and interests add no effect on their broader worldview or political designs? American History versus Propaganda I assume most people are at least somewhat aware that the historical figures portrayed in Hamilton in reality failed to live up to the ideals of liberty and equality that they put forth and that they weren't exactly the most progressive people when it came to race or gender. Or at least, I expect most people who are neutral to positive on the idea of casting people of color for the roles of these historical figures to be more or less aware of this. This is really no thanks to the history education most of us received. Even in the blue state public school education I received, my initial introduction to the founding of America was a simple story of great men fighting injustice and sticking up for freedom against the oppressive British Empire. And this history wasn't much complicated, even as I went through middle school and into high school American history. I'm sure to some extent this was informed by what teacher you get in the school system. In my case, my teacher had a very obvious crush on Old Hickory, so maybe my experience is not completely representative. And certainly, having an overly positive view of one's national history is not unique to America. But as James W. Lowen, author of Lies My Teacher Told Me, points out in the introduction to the second edition of the same, Educators first required American history as a high school subject as part of a nationalist flag-waving campaign around 1900. In the original introduction, he writes, textbooks in American history are often muddled by the conflicting desires to promote inquiry and to indoctrinate blind patriotism. The titles themselves tell the story. The Great Republic, The American Pageant, Land of Promise, Triumph of the American Nation. Such titles differ from the titles of all other textbooks students read in high school or college. Chemistry books, for example, are called chemistry or principles of chemistry, not triumph of the molecule. And you can tell history textbooks just from their covers, graced as they are with American flags, bald eagles, the Washington Monument. In an interview with Katie Couric, he explains part of the reason for the blatant nationalist bent of textbooks as follows. Texas is in a notorious position because it's the largest state that adopts uniformly across the state in high school. Basically, no publisher wants to not be able to sell in Texas, so they pretty much make any changes that the textbook committee in Texas wants them to. You might recall a few articles going around a few years ago about various topics that were being proposed to be cut, as well as topics already being discussed in a transparently misleading way in Texas textbooks. In particular, a scandal surrounding a Texas student taking pictures of textbooks referring to the kidnapped and enslaved Africans brought to America as workers sparked a lot of outrage online. It was only in 2019 that changes were applied to the curriculum to admit that slavery played a central role in the Civil War. The standard from 2010 was to list slavery as one of many causes below sectionalism and states' rights. I guess we can be thankful these more egregious examples of historical whitewashing have been caught and revised, but it raises the question about what more subtle framings and outright omissions and lies likely remain. For some examples and a much more detailed explication of the flaws in how American history is taught in schools, Lies My Teacher Told Me is an engaging resource. School is certainly where most of us get our initial history education, but the version of history flattering to the United States is reinforced in the way that politicians and journalists talk fondly about our history and historical figures, and there's no shortage of historical revisionism on the internet. I don't know, guys. It kind of feels like we get more American mythology than we do verifiable history. I don't know how to explain to you that the Founding Fathers were bad people, the history of the American Revolution is not exempt from these issues with historical myth-making. 
Although, as I mentioned, nowadays people have increasingly come to acknowledge the shortcomings of the Founding Fathers when it comes to their lack of action on slavery, and direct exclusion of women, black and indigenous people, and basically anyone who didn't own land, this rarely extends to criticizing the system they created. Most of us in America have learned a framing of the American Revolution as having been a revolution against tyranny on behalf of a united people, led by a group of roguish gentlemen scholars who went on to found the nation on principles of liberty and justice for all. And, if we're being nuanced, that the nation would eventually be able to live up to these ideals despite the flaws of the framers. But this reading leaves out a lot of pertinent details. It would be easy to get through your American history education without realizing how ridiculously wealthy most of the Founding Fathers were. For one thing, they're constantly juxtaposed with the literal monarchy. For another, their canonization as a group of underdogs definitely invokes more of an image of a small business owner or ordinary people, as Koch brothers Psyop, Governor Scott Walker was known to say, than a bunch of trust fund kids literally carried around in their infancy by the humans their parents straight up owned. George Washington was literally the richest man in America, and almost all of them were well-educated men of means who were dominant in their communities and states, and many were also prominent in national affairs. As a recent fact-checked viral tweet points out, over 70% of the Founding Fathers pictured in the painting Declaration of Independence were slaveholders. The Founding Fathers' primary motivation for seceding from the British Empire was their own economic interest, and it took some finagling for them to get the lower classes, who were not as much in a position to benefit but who would need to end up doing most of the fighting, to align themselves against the British. As Howard Zinn writes in A People's History of the United States, they found that by creating a nation, a symbol, a legal unity called the United States, they could take over land, profits, and political power from favorites of the British Empire. In one example of their tendency toward enriching themselves and their friends, revolutionary leaders gave land confiscated from loyalists fleeing the country mostly to the ruling class, some to small farmers to create a broad sense of support for the new government and to act as a buffer between the rich and the dispossessed. The lower classes did not see much change in their station as a result of the revolution, but a lot of them sure did die for it anyway. The revolution also left Native Americans in a particularly bad spot. Zinn puts it perfectly. What did the revolution mean to the Native Americans? The Indians. They had been ignored by the fine words of the Declaration, had not been considered equal, certainly not in choosing those who would govern the American territories in which they lived, nor in being able to pursue the happiness as they had pursued it for centuries before the white Europeans arrived. Now, with the British out of the way, the Americans could begin the inexorable process of pushing the Indians off their lands, killing them if they resisted. It's not really a wonder that most Native Americans fought for England during the war. Again, aspects of these facts are widely acknowledged and criticized by Democrats in general. Especially in recent memory, praise of the Founding Fathers often comes with acknowledgement of at least their slaveholding, exclusion of women, and troubling interactions with Natives. Their wealth is still more or less obfuscated, or is at least not acknowledged as being relevant in the same way. And the less principled and more selfish reasons they had for going to war are likewise not really brought up. The Constitution and the revolution leading to it have garnered nowhere near the level of criticism in recent years as the men who wrote it. Many modern liberals view the Constitution not unlike early 19th century historian George Bancroft. The Constitution establishes nothing that interferes with equality and individuality. It knows nothing of differences by dissent or opinions or favored classes, or legalized religion, or the political power of property. This egalitarian view of the Constitution is a common reading, and suggests the goal of the framers was to create a society which prioritized rights for all and was agnostic towards power dynamics between individuals. 20th century historian Charles Beard forwards an interpretation more grounded in the Founding Fathers' economic and political motivations. He claims that the establishment of a strong federal government was motivated by the need for protective tariffs for manufacturers, ending the use of paper money to pay off debts for moneylenders, protection for land speculators invading Indian lands, federal security against slave revolts and runaways for slave owners, and a government able to raise money by nationwide taxation so it could pay off bonds for bondholders. As Zinn points out, the Constitution did not reflect the interests of slaves, indentured servants, women, men without property, because they were not represented in the Constitutional Convention. This is not to say that the Constitution was exclusively written for the benefit of the framers, 
But as Beard says, the Constitution centered around the economic interests they understood and felt in concrete, definite form through their own personal experience. So, to return to my earlier question, can we say that the Founding Fathers' more objectionable beliefs and interests had no effect on their broader worldview or political designs? Well, one answer to this is, well, duh. They explicitly excluded the majority of people in the country from the entire electoral system, partially revolted so they could continue infringing on native lands, and despite many of them being consciously aware of the conflict between their ideas about all men being endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, they did not even mention the word slavery in the Constitution. And the reference to unfree persons was only included to explicitly count them as less than fully human. And that would be a pretty fair assessment. But I think we can go a little further. Someone might easily respond, well, okay, these are all things we were able to reform with time. Slavery was abolished, we now have universal suffrage, and we stopped taking native land at some point, right? Now setting aside the remaining effects from these injustices that linger to this day, our government's framework from this standpoint is at least not in as stark contrast with the stated intentions and philosophies of the Founding Fathers. But does this mean the Constitution has been, or ever can be, fully separated from the less enlightened views of the men who designed it? This one's a little trickier, but I'd say no. In obvious and subtle ways, the Constitution was designed to be and remains a document that outlines a system of government that makes it very easy for those who have power and resources to maintain them, and which makes those without power or resources struggle to attain them. And in this sense, some aspects of the political system have not improved much at all, and have arguably regressed in some ways. Now, we don't only have the Electoral College intended to prevent popular coalitions creating this two-party system most of us resent, we also have a campaign finance system that makes running a campaign not financed by wealthy interests incredibly difficult. Just look at the state of our modern political system. Things like Medicare for All, action on climate change, and a wealth tax are all really popular legislation that have no chance in our political system as it stands. I mean, Christ, it's definitely not my hobby horse, but 84% of voters support universal background checks for gun purchases, and how much movement have we seen on that issue in two decades of mass shootings? Loopholes never intended by the framers have been so worn through in modern politics that our legislative system has been rendered basically useless. All I'm saying is maybe it's possible a group of the richest guys in the colonies didn't design a system perfectly from scratch that could continue to serve the interests of all Americans for the rest of time with only the occasional amendment. I should just be asking you all to read A People's History of the United States at this point, and you should, it's great. But to quote from Zinn a final time for this section, When economic interest is seen behind the political clauses of the Constitution, then the document becomes not simply the work of wise men trying to establish a decent and orderly society, but the work of certain groups trying to maintain their privileges while giving just enough rights and liberties to enough of the people to ensure popular support. So, when it comes to the Founding Fathers, you do not, under any circumstances, gotta hand it to them. America, but make it woke. Given that I hadn't watched Hamilton before I decided to make this video, I think it's only fair I not assume all of you have seen or listened to it. So, let's do a plot summary. For the benefit of anyone who wants to get more context on what I'm saying, the name of whatever song the action I'm discussing takes place during will appear on screen. Check the description for a timestamp to skip this if you've seen the musical and have a decent memory. Let's pad this runtime. The musical opens on the story of Alexander Hamilton's early life struggles growing up orphaned in the small island of Nevis in the Caribbean, watching his home destroyed by a hurricane and eventually using his intellect and hard work to write his way out of obscurity and to New York. Hoping to get on an accelerated course of study, Hamilton seeks out Aaron Burr, who has done the same. Burr takes Hamilton for a drink where he meets John Lorenz, Marquis de Lafayette, and Hercules Mulligan, and the four of them express their support of the revolution. Burr cautions them to keep a lower profile with their views, but Hamilton's free expression gains him admiration and sets him on the path to continue socially climbing. We're next introduced to the Schuyler sisters, Angelica, Eliza, and Peggy, and they are established as the smart, socially active one, the optimistic, idealistic one, and the one that doesn't really matter, respectively, and we're told their family is very wealthy. Back to Hamilton and his buddies, we see Alexander get into a public disagreement with Samuel Seabury, who is on a soapbox about the dangers of the Continental Congress and their calls for revolution. Burr is again annoyed at Hamilton's candor. Across the ocean, we get the first of three appearances by the fabulous King George III. He addresses the colonists to tell them their revolution is in vain, and affirms his intention to use the military might of the monarchy to quash it. As the British troops arrive, Hamilton prepares for war, and George Washington makes a dramatic first appearance. 
Washington laments the difficulties he faces in keeping his troops motivated, as well as the challenges of their smaller numbers and comparably much fewer resources, and concludes he needs a right-hand man. Hamilton, who has just been shown stealing cannons from the British, is chosen for this role over Aaron Burr, and accepts despite his desire to prove himself on the battlefield. After Hamilton's womanizing tendencies are firmly established, ew, as well as the benefits a union with a woman from a well-off family would grant him, he finally crosses paths with the Schuyler sisters at a ball. Eliza is instantly infatuated with Hamilton at first sight, and with the aid of an introduction from her sister Angelica, she and Hamilton begin a relationship and soon get married. In Angelica's wedding toast, we are shown a flashback from her perspective, and it's revealed that before she introduced Hamilton to her sister Eliza, she had already fallen for him that same night and decided to push her feelings aside, a decision she expresses some misgivings about. Burr attends the wedding celebration, and it's revealed that he's having an affair with the British officer's wife. Hamilton encourages him to go for it. In the next song, Burr sings about how he wants to be with this woman, Theodosia, but like with his political aspirations, he has decided that it is worth it to wait for it. The war rages on and things are looking grim, so Hamilton and Washington decide to pursue another strategy. Hamilton wants to be given the position of second in command, but Washington appoints Charles Lee instead, who retreats in an important battle, and Washington puts Lafayette in charge. Lee begins to criticize Washington publicly, but Washington forbids Hamilton from dueling him. John Lorenz duels him in Hamilton's place and wins. Washington is furious to hear this development and sends Hamilton home. Upon returning home, Hamilton finds out that Eliza is pregnant with their first child. She encourages him to accept what they have in life, tells him he doesn't need to keep fighting to build a legacy, and asks to let her be part of the narrative where he decides to stay. Lafayette manages to get further funding from France. He and Washington plan to stop the British forces at Yorktown, and Lafayette convinces Washington to finally bring Hamilton in to lead the troops. Washington cautions Hamilton that history is watching, imparting the story of the great failure of his own first command, and tells him ultimately they do not have control over how they will be remembered. We are next shown the Battle of Yorktown, featuring the roles Hamilton, Lafayette, Lorenz, and Mulligan all play in the battle. It's explained that the battle ends with the British surrendering after a week of fighting, and with negotiations of peace, the revolutionaries celebrate their victory. But back across the sea, the king warns that ruling is not so easy. The final song of Act One is a bit of a blitz. Hamilton and Burr return to New York and complete their education. Both become lawyers. Hamilton is invited to the Constitutional Convention, where he proposes a plan for the new government. He asks Burr to help him defend the new constitution, but Burr refuses, and Hamilton writes the Federalist Papers with James Madison and John Jay. Angelica tells Hamilton she is moving to London with her new husband, but tells him to write. Washington asks Hamilton to be his treasury secretary, and he agrees, though Eliza asks him to stay. In the start of Act Two, we're introduced to Thomas Jefferson, newly returned from a long absence in France, who Washington is asked to be Secretary of State. James Madison comes to Jefferson and asks for his help to fight against Hamilton's financial plan, calling it nothing less than government control. In the first of the cabinet rap battles, Jefferson does just that, and after a heated discussion, Madison and Jefferson remind Hamilton he doesn't have the votes for his plan. Hamilton is unsure what to do and feels he can't convince them, but Washington instructs him to find a compromise. Eliza begs Hamilton to take a break from his work on his financial plan and spend the summer on her father's estate. Angelica encourages Hamilton to find a compromise with Thomas Jefferson, and after some romantic tension in one of their letters, reveals she will be coming back from London for the summer to join them. Hamilton refuses the trip, saying he needs to get his plan through Congress. While his family is away for the summer, Hamilton, hard at work on his proposal and in a weak moment, as the musical is very eager to assure us, is visited by Maria Reynolds, who explains she is being mistreated by her husband, but he's disappeared and she's in need of help. Hamilton gives her money and walks her home, where this woman apparently throws herself at him, and Hamilton proceeds to cheat on his wife repeatedly over the course of the month. James Reynolds, Maria's husband, finds out about this affair and blackmails Hamilton, saying he can continue seeing his wife if he pays, but otherwise he would tell Eliza. Maria insists she didn't tell him, and then says she didn't know any better. Hamilton is deeply upset and worried, but accepts the blackmail and continues the affair. This whole thing is a mess in a way that's not relevant to my point, but I will talk about it at the end, I promise. At a dinner meeting, Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison reach a compromise, trading the location of the capital for the votes for Hamilton's financial plan. Burr resents being left out of this meeting, and decides to switch parties to snag Philip Schuyler's seat in the New York Senate and wins, and Hamilton ends their friendship. In the second cabinet battle, Jefferson debates Hamilton to convince Washington of whether the nation should aid France in their revolution. Jefferson says we owe it to them for their crucial role in aiding the American Revolution, but Hamilton argues their new nation is in no position to be helping other countries. Washington sides with Hamilton, and after the decision is made, Jefferson reminds Hamilton he promised Lafayette they would help the French fight for their freedom, and Hamilton argues they can't get involved in every revolution. Jefferson, Madison, and Burr conclude that Hamilton will continue to be a problem as long as he has influence over the president and resolve to dig up dirt on him. Washington informs Hamilton that Jefferson has resigned from his position as Secretary of State to run for president, and Hamilton is amused, saying he has no chance against Washington. 
Washington tells him he's stepping down as president and has him draft his farewell address. In King George's final appearance, he's in disbelief Washington would step down from leadership and is tickled to hear John Adams will be replacing him, excited to watch the country eat him alive. John Adams fires Hamilton, and Hamilton publishes a response, destroying the reputation of the only other significant member of his party. Jefferson, Madison, and Burr confront Hamilton, informing him they had found the check stubs of the money he paid to James Reynolds, thinking he was embezzling from the government. Hamilton, in exchange for secrecy, tells them the truth to prove he did not break the law, explaining the money he spent was his own, and revealing the affair. Hamilton is not sure he can trust them, however, and writes the Reynolds pamphlet, exposing his affair to the world. Jefferson, Madison, and Burr celebrate the end of Hamilton's political career, and Angelica comes back from England to admonish him and support her sister. Eliza mourns her relationship with Hamilton, burning their letters, and says she is erasing herself from the narrative. Hamilton's son Philip, now a man, goes looking for a guy named George Eaker to challenge him to a duel for disparaging his father's legacy. Eaker is contemptuous of Philip, but accepts. Philip asks his father for advice, and Hamilton tells him when the time comes to shoot his gun into the air to end the whole thing, rather than shoot Eaker and have to live with killing him. Philip agrees and goes off to the duel where he's mortally wounded, having followed his father's instructions. He dies with his parents by his side. Hamilton and Eliza move uptown to grieve, and he implores her to let him be by her side through this and to forgive him, which she eventually does. The election of 1800 begins, and with Adams essentially out of the running, it comes down to Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. Hamilton is asked for his opinion on the race, and when it comes down to a tie, Hamilton finally endorses Jefferson due to Burr's lack of beliefs. Jefferson denies Burr's claim to the vice presidency. Burr, locked out from power due to Hamilton's endorsement, challenges him to a duel, which Hamilton accepts, refusing to take back what he said about Burr and introducing his own list of grievances. When the time comes, Burr fires. Time freezes, and Hamilton reflects on his legacy, the country he helped build, and the things he had not accomplished. As time resumes, Hamilton shoots into the sky, and Burr's shot hits Hamilton. Burr reflects on this, saying the world was big enough for both Hamilton and him, and though Hamilton died, he was the one that paid for it. In the final song of the musical, we get a brief rundown of Hamilton's accomplishments from a few other characters before Eliza takes center stage to talk about her own accomplishments later in life and the work she did to tell other stories. She and the cast wonder if their stories will be told. She gasps, and the stage goes black. The end. I would be remiss to get into criticizing Hamilton without acknowledging what it was that people liked so much about it. It's not as though all or even most fans of the musical were completely uncritical of the Founding Fathers, and it's not as though everyone watching it took it as a completely factual history. Talking about Hamilton strictly in terms of historical accuracy or the content of the musical absent its presentation or the time period in which it gained most of its popularity would leave out many of the details most relevant to its success. Like many cultural properties of that era and today, some part of its appeal came from what politics it was explicitly rejecting. Hamilton, in casting the Founding Fathers as men and women of color in an era when a vocal minority was questioning the Americanness of people who weren't white, it was a reminder of who was frequently erased from the American self-conception. The musical has explicit themes of taking back narratives and how history is told. In a very real way, taking a whitewashed version of history and turning it into a hip-hop musical starring people who would have been considered subhuman by the very people it was about takes back the narrative of the old America for the new multiracial America. This is articulated by Mark Benelli in his Rolling Stone interview with Lin-Manuel Miranda and other cast members when he writes, Having the Founding Fathers look like America today strikes me as so radical. And it made me think of some of the Tea Party rhetoric, of how these conservatives were saying, we need to take our country back. And to me, this show felt like it was saying, no, you're not taking the country back. And in fact, we're part of the whole history of this country, even going back to the puffy shirts and the tricorn hats. If you couldn't tell, this article was written before the 2016 election, hence the rather optimistic tone. But it wasn't just about what it seemed to mean for the country. For many, it was also about what it meant for them as individuals. In the same interview, Leslie Odom Jr., who plays Aaron Burr in the musical to much acclaim, describes seeing an early version of the song The Story of Tonight, where Hamilton and friends Hercules Mulligan, Marquis de Lafayette, and John Lorenz toast one another on the eve of the revolution. That's the one that made me a puddle because it was four men of color on stage singing a song about friendship and brotherhood and love, and I had never seen that in a musical. I had seen white guys do it, in Jersey Boys and Les Mis, never seen a black guy. So I was a mess, and from that point on, I was along for the ride. And for all I have to criticize about Hamilton, I'm not cold-hearted. I love that Odom and so many others who would go on to see the musical got to see themselves in a history that has only ever shown them as victims, if at all in a medium that rarely includes them. It's also worth acknowledging that compared to the way we here in the U.S. talk about the Founding Fathers, 
Hamilton looks like a nuanced and critical look at them as people, as fallible and imperfect. As Miranda himself put it, I think our goal is to present them as human, and not just the five facts you know about them from your history books. So it's about how Washington fucked up a lot before he became the father of our country. It's about how Hamilton kept his eye on his work and really fucked up at home. It's about how Jefferson wrote really eloquently about freedom and owned over 600 people. None of them gets off scot-free in our show. I love this quote, because it just says so much about what was intended by these portrayals when juxtaposed with the actual content. I mean, given the choice between humanizing Alexander Hamilton and his colleagues and leaving them as an infallible pantheon of the American mythos, I can honestly say what Hamilton does is preferable, and I can almost see why so many fans, and Miranda himself, see the play as being a complicated look at their lives and histories. But for the most part, the flaws we see on stage are personal flaws, and not even severe ones. There are AMC anti-heroes portrayed more critically than Alexander Hamilton. This should go without saying, but my issues with Hamilton have very little to do with his arrogance or infidelity. And don't even get me started on Washington. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Even where it has merit, Hamilton misses a few good opportunities for further nuance. I mentioned before that Hamilton takes a whitewashed version of history and adds back color with its cast and style, but doing this doesn't change everything that's been sanitized about that history. For a musical meant to counter a narrative that centers a white version of history, it seems a little ironic that essentially only white historical figures are depicted, though Sally Hemings has a brief appearance. Even in cases where including black historical figures would have been easy, and could have served Miranda's purported desire for nuance, such as Hercules Mulligan's fellow spy, his slave Cato, the opportunity was missed. In the same vein, a scene featuring Hamilton and Washington suppressing the Whiskey Rebellion and another, a rap battle about slavery between Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton, were both cut. Now, of course, every history must inevitably leave some things out, and I can see how including certain details would have gotten in the way of the story Miranda wanted to tell. It's not like I went into Hamilton expecting it to excoriate the Founding Fathers by portraying all the most transparently awful things they did or to tear apart the Constitution. While I see these omissions as a loss for the story and Miranda's desire to complicate these figures, I'm more concerned with how these figures are actually portrayed. See, Hamilton doesn't stop at including a diverse cast and musical style in its reclamation of history. To this end, aspects of the characters' lives and beliefs are emphasized throughout the musical to make progressive political statements, often resulting in misleading portrayals of the real-life figures. A frequently cited example of this is the portrayal of Hamilton as an abolitionist. Alexander Hamilton was anti-slavery, though to what extent is up for debate, but he didn't advocate abolition, and his writings included little to nothing against slavery. Yet, in the musical, the character of Hamilton refers to himself as a revolutionary manumission abolitionist, He's also shown in the Battle of Yorktown chatting with Lorenz that we will never be free until we end slavery. And at the end of the musical, it's implied he would have done much more on slavery if he'd had time before his early demise. Stolen valor much? The Schuylers get a similar revision. They get a sort of proto-feminist treatment in some regards. At one point in the song, The Schuyler Sisters, Angelica says of Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence that she would compel him to include women in the sequel. Work. Though at the end of the musical Eliza sings about how she spoke out against slavery later in life, there's never any mention of where the Schuylers got the money that's such a part of the family's characterization. Hint, they were major slaveholders. Yes, queen. Lean in. Be a boss babe. Slavery isn't wholly absent from the musical, but despite the fact that of the historical figures featured, the majority directly owned slaves or were involved in their management, only Thomas Jefferson is criticized for it. In one of the cabinet rap battles, Hamilton counters Jefferson's praise of the Southern economy with, yeah, keep ranting, we know who's really doing the planting, and referring to Jefferson as a slaver. This gives Hamilton's character a moral high ground over Jefferson, which reinforces his characterization as a kind of liberal hero in the musical. Hamilton also directly links struggles of the colonial revolutionaries to modern civil rights struggles. Nowhere in the musical is this more blatant than with how it uses the word immigrant. Especially in the political climate Hamilton was conceived in, immigration was one of the biggest issues dividing liberals and conservatives, and the character of Hamilton is constantly associated with it. The epithet the immigrant appears frequently in reference to Hamilton, and Jefferson and Madison even use it derogatorily toward him. In the song Yorktown, the world turned upside down, Marquis de Lafayette exclaims, immigrants, and he and Hamilton continue in unison, We get the job done. I... From Hamilton. A line that in live performances is such a reliable applause line that the creators have lengthened the pause that follows to allow time for the sound to die down. All in all, Alexander Hamilton is called an immigrant 11 times in the show, but with the emphasis it's given, it feels like a lot more. 
Which is wild. You'd think based on this, he was actually really pro-immigrant in real life, or at least was an immigrant in a recognizably modern sense. To call Hamilton an immigrant is not technically incorrect, but it is misleading. He was born a resident of one British colony and moved to another, and though he considered himself an outsider, he wasn't exactly fond of immigrants. According to historian Joanne Freeman, while Alexander Hamilton favored immigrant workers boosting the economy, he fretted about the corruption of the national character in the face of loosening citizenship requirements and supported the Alien and Sedition Act. Huh. You know, he was kind of the worst blend of modern Democratic and Republican views on immigration in that way. Hmm. To be clear, this immigration-friendly message, like being anti-slavery and pro-women suffrage, is a good thing. It's wonderful to see such a clear declaration of pro-immigrant sentiment at a time when ICE is actively rounding up immigrants and when the president has stoked so much xenophobia. But for one thing, this line falls into the common ideological trap of pointing to the hard work of immigrants in order to justify their being here, rather than their humanity being enough. But for another, and this is basically the crux of the issue for me, using Alexander Hamilton as the mouthpiece of this good idea ends up making the audience incorrectly associated with him. I want to make it clear, I don't think this is some subversive plot by Lin-Manuel Miranda to trick progressives into thinking the Founding Fathers were woke bays. I think it's an unintended consequence of the kind of reclamation of history Hamilton attempts, which is very much a double-edged sword. It's pretty clear, I think, watching the musical, or at least reading any interviews with Miranda, that he just really identified with Hamilton's story as portrayed by Ron Chernow, and saw in the cast of characters not only commonalities with modern hip-hop artists such as Busta Rhymes, Rakeem, and Common, but commonalities with modern political movements and direct lines to our present-day political climate. Hamilton, inasmuch as it's about politics, which is admittedly almost window-dressing compared to its more prominent themes of legacy and ambition, takes a lot of interest in the political process and how politicians engage with it, and it's not exactly neutral on this. Let's take a minute here to talk about what it is American liberals, generally speaking, value in politics. Yes, we associate things like social justice and stuff with liberals, but I mean, what do they value in a political process? What do people like Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer care about? What do they signal as important to us as Americans? Admittedly, kind of a big question, but the things I'm getting at are their emphasis on the need to compromise, nonpartisanship, the importance of civility, the value of measured, logical debate on the issues. On the flip side, they warn us against polarization, against being so stubborn with our progressive politics that we alienate middle America or fail to get anything done, and they resist the temptations of political moves that might get them called hypocritical. Never mind that most of their compromises end up just being what Republicans wanted in the first place, never mind that their civility and adherence to the process gets them steamrolled, and no matter how much they think Hillary Clinton epically owned Cheeto Man in the debate, He's the guy that won. Innuendo Studios' video from his alt-right playbook series, You Go High, We Go Low, goes more into this and why liberals are like this in much more detail. Though, I think he undersells the degree to which hardcore Democrats actually like that Democratic politicians care so much about these things. Enter Hamilton. Hamilton isn't as extreme in its worship of process or decorum as properties like the West Wing or the Newsroom that liberals also adore, but it contains many of the same ideas. <laughs> And this especially plays out in the political philosophies of the characters and how those philosophies are framed. I mentioned before that George Washington doesn't exactly get much criticism in this portrayal, but that's an understatement. I mean, there's literally a line saying Hamilton has been called to be seated at the right hand of the father. I was speaking metaphorically about deification, but come on. Alexander Hamilton's character gets his high and low points with his ambition and infidelity, Burr, as I'll get into, is portrayed as unprincipled and two-faced as a politician, and Jefferson gets a bit of a villain treatment with Madison, and of course he's called out for his slavery, but Washington doesn't even get this degree of nuance. The main criticism Washington receives comes from Charles Lee, who, after Washington demotes him for his poor showing at the Battle of Monmouth, says, Washington cannot be left alone to his devices, indecisive from crisis to crisis. The best thing he can do for the revolution is turn back and go plant in tobacco in Mount Vernon. Lee is framed as, I'm a general who is... Well, pretty incompetent. And the audience is clearly supposed to see this as more founded in Lee's bitterness than reality. But that's not even the kicker. In light of this, Washington, ever wise and even-tempered, instructs everyone not to act, saying history will prove him wrong. In a continuation of his role as wizened leader, the other instance of criticism of Washington actually comes from the man himself. Reflecting on his legacy and past failures, he explains to Hamilton that at the start of his military command, I led my men straight into a massacre. I witnessed their deaths firsthand. 
I made every mistake and felt the shame rise in me, and even now I lie awake. More than paint him in a critical or nuanced light in the way Miranda apparently thinks it does, this admission of past regret emphasizes Washington's growth, and while certainly humanizing, not in any way that detracts from his god-hero status. Though all those men probably wouldn't have died in the first place if Washington, then with no combat experience, hadn't been given command on the basis of his wealth and status. It's in the second act, though, that Washington's characterization really starts to shine. Evolving from respected and even-tempered general to fully realized daddy of America, our first president. In his appearance as president in the musical, Washington appears mainly to preside over the cabinet battles, in which his position as moderator emphasizes his nonpartisanship, something he's remembered fondly for. In the first of these battles, Washington pulls Hamilton aside after his debate with Jefferson on Hamilton's financial plan proposal, calmly chiding him through his protest that the other side won't listen to find a compromise. Even the best character, and one of the primary antagonists of the musical, King George III, can't let Washington go without praising him. In I Know Him, he says of Washington, Who's next? There's nobody else in their country who looms quite as large. And later, next to Washington, they all look small. The thing that really solidifies Washington's characterization is, fittingly, his farewell address. Washington's farewell address is something I remember really being emphasized in my American history education growing up, especially because so many of my teachers seemed to really want us to think he was quite something for it. And don't get me wrong, for a bunch of guys who grew up under a monarchy, it's not unremarkable that the first ruler of a new country with a new democracy would step down to set a good example. I could think of a less charitable reading on why you would do this, but whatever, it doesn't ultimately matter. But taken at face value, it makes sense why so many Americans would think so highly of Washington's farewell address, especially in today's political climate, and Hamilton definitely captures this. The song One Last Time is the play's rendition of the address where Washington instructs Alexander Hamilton to write his farewell. He tells Hamilton, I want to warn against partisan fighting. An easy thing to warn against when you're independently wealthy and have no horse in the race like Washington, I suppose. As Hamilton begs him not to step down, saying he'll be called weak, that he's uniquely needed and suited to the presidency, Washington, sage as always, responds repeatedly that this will teach them how to say goodbye so the nation learns to move on. It's a really sentimental moment that even managed to tug at my heartstrings. The song concludes with the final two paragraphs of Washington's actual address, in which he acknowledges that he likely made errors and hopes they will be consigned to oblivion. I find it interesting, but not particularly surprising, which parts of the address Miranda chose to represent in this song. Certainly, Washington placed a lot of emphasis on why he wanted to step down, as well as his cautions against parties and call for unity. But his address was long, and there were many things Miranda could have included. Washington also advised the nation not to take on a lot of debt, to avoid permanent attachments with other nations, and the importance of religion. But none of these make it into the song. I'm not asking why that's the case, or saying it's bad. It's clear Miranda has a particular way he wants to frame Washington, and the thing that's emphasized is the warning against partisanship, and of course the content that works with the musical's theme related to legacy. Ultimately, I wouldn't be able to portray just how pro-Washington this musical is without ensuring a copyright takedown of this video, which I'm already pretty worried about. And honestly, I think the best way to get this is just to watch the musical for yourself. But since Jefferson has basically become the scapegoat of the Founding Fathers, Washington definitely doesn't face much criticism at all, even from those of us critical of these men. He's almost off-limits in a way, so when he's portrayed in Hamilton so positively, it just reinforces the high opinion most Americans already have of him, one that we should all, I think, be challenging. Though Alexander Hamilton is not given the same beyond reproach status as Washington, he too is posited as a model politician in many ways, albeit a more complicated one. Our first introduction to Hamilton's political aspirations, the song Aaron Burr, Sir, also introduces us formally to Aaron Burr, Hamilton's foil throughout the musical, matching him in ambition but entirely different in methods, and sets the groundwork for their dynamic. Hamilton comes on strong, talking excitedly about his dreams and his desire to join the revolution, while Burr responds in short statements. When Burr finally takes over the conversation, it's to give Hamilton the ultimate politician advice, talk less, smile more, don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. Hamilton reacts to this advice in disbelief, and this line becomes a motif between these two characters, appearing in The Room Where It Happens and The Election of 1800. At the end of Aaron Burr, Sir, Hamilton is rewarded for his candor with his political views, attracting the attention of the men who will raise his profile as a revolutionary leader. Burr is admonished for his shrewdness. Gee, if only the Democratic Party worked more like that. Their dynamic is reinforced and Farmer refuted. Hamilton gets into a public argument with a proselytizer trying to dissuade listeners from joining the revolution, and Burr begs him to leave him alone. 
Hamilton responds, Burr, I'd rather be divisive than indecisive. Drop the niceties. Hamilton's approach gained him the position as Washington's right-hand man, which Burr was shooting for. At the end of Act 1, in the song Nonstop, Hamilton cites corruption and a stalling economy as why public service seems to be calling him. During his appearance at the Constitutional Convention, we see Hamilton continuing to fight for what he believes, and the musical emphasizes his determination and ingenuity, proposing his own form of government. He later asks for Burr's help advocating for it, and, true to his characterization, Burr refuses to stick his neck out for even something he, by his own admission, supports, so he can see which way the wind will blow. Hamilton is made Secretary of Treasury. Early on, Hamilton is portrayed as ambitious and dedicated, but ultimately idealistic, seeking to advocate his positions with argument. But soon enough, we start to see this idealism run into issues. In the wake of the first cabinet battle, after Angelica reiterates Washington's point, encouraging Hamilton to sit down with Jefferson and compromise, we start to see him compromise first his ethics in cheating on his wife, and in the very next song, The Room Where It Happens, we see him begin to embrace a bit of the game of politics. This is a really interesting song, apparently inspired by Miranda's own experiences seeing his father, who worked in politics, have political meetings at home while Miranda sat in the back of the room. The song projects to the audience that this part of politics is a messy process no one really sees unless they're involved, invoking the metaphor of how the sausage gets made. While it certainly isn't a positive portrayal, like many of the more dubious political choices by Hamilton, there's a sense that this is just how it is, that in order to get what you want, you need to be willing to get your hands dirty or to make hard choices for the greater good. When Burr asks about the decision made over dinner, Hamilton tells him, But you don't get a win unless you play in the game. Oh, you get love for it, you get hate for it, you get nothing if you wait for it. Having heard this, Burr exclaims that we don't get a say in what they trade away, but repeatedly expresses his desire to be in the room where it happens. And with this, he switches parties to defeat Philip Schuyler and become a senator, a move for which Hamilton admonishes him, complaining, no one knows who you are or what you do, and he ends their friendship over it. I wish he would have shown the same willingness to lose friends over principles for his slaveholding peers, but sure, lack of conviction in one's belief is a reason too, I guess. In the second cabinet battle, Hamilton runs up against more moral gray. Despite his earlier promise to Lafayette that America would be with him when he brought freedom to France, Hamilton advocates against Jefferson's call to stand with the French in their revolution. Despite Jefferson having the moral high ground and even later chastising him for breaking his promise, asking, have you an ounce of regret? You accumulate debt, you accumulate power, yet in their hour of need, you forget. This is not ultimately portrayed as a moral failing on Hamilton's part. There aren't really any direct narrative consequences for this decision, nor with his other compromises, and he convinced Washington after all. The core of Hamilton's political portrayal in the musical comes toward the end with the election of 1800. Hamilton is asked to choose between endorsing Thomas Jefferson, his political rival with whom he has never agreed once, or his former friend Aaron Burr. He chooses Jefferson, citing that Jefferson has beliefs, Burr has none. A decision that will ultimately lead to his death, but that captures an interesting political ideal that it's better to support someone who will, in your own view, take the country in a harmful direction than someone who's unprincipled. Hamilton, in its portrayal of the political process, favors a particular view of politics which can be applied to our modern system, one in which we prioritize things like compromise and nonpartisanship, as well as the importance of fighting for what you believe in, and accept that sometimes this means making hard decisions. While I think oftentimes the idea of necessary evils is used to justify evils that weren't really as necessary as they seemed, or that wouldn't have been so necessary under a different system, these are basically good ideas. That said, idealizing them is complicated by the differences between our present political climate and that of Hamilton's era. Just look at who is rewarded in the story and who's not. Hamilton constantly succeeds due to his rhetorical talent and openness with his beliefs, while Burr's entire story in the musical is essentially him wanting and failing to gain political power. This is directly related to the fact that he wants political power not because of a desire to serve people, but for personal gain. In his attempts to gain power, he refuses to be open about his views, even in cases where we know he has an opinion. Within the narrative of the musical, this causes him to mostly be cut out of gaining power, which is in stark contrast to the political reality of the real world, where most politicians seem to be like Burr in this regard and still do pretty well for themselves. As for the emphasis on compromise in the story, the men who had just come out of fighting together in a revolution, who were all pretty much of the same class, all white, all men, had basically the same interests as one another. For them, politics was often a difference of opinion on things for which compromise meant deciding whether slaves should count as half a person or three-quarters of a person, and coming together to agree on three-fifths. 
Today, Democrats still talk a lot about compromise and working across the aisle. But due to the larger proportion of the country that's allowed to vote, there's a lot less common ground. And compromising between wanting LGBT people to have rights or not, health care for everyone or only those who can afford it, or defunding the police or continuing to allow black lives to be destroyed by an institution that was never meant to help them, there's not much room for negotiation that isn't a loss. Regardless, I can see what liberals like about Hamilton. It presents an ideal of America that is diverse but remains rooted in our history and our values. It's a version of our history they can be proud of and that is more in line with their modern beliefs and presents a conception of politics that feels true and preferable to them. But I really can't relate. Conclusion The reality of who the Founding Fathers really were and what they did create a lot of problems for modern Democrats as they try to invoke their memory. Our traditional stories about these men which gloss over any flaws and make them out to be heroes beyond reproach simply don't work for an electorate so critical of the legacy of racism, sexism, and xenophobia in this country. But Hamilton does. Hamilton invents an American mythos progressives can get behind, where America is diverse and our enemies are sneering white men modeled after every Twitter post about someone's trash dick XBF. No more true, but just as evocative of American virtues as the versions that came before it. It basically posits the historical analog of the liberal interpretation of the Constitution and American politics in general. That things would be basically fine, not perfect, but still pretty good, if there hadn't been these blind spots on race and gender and immigration. And it's this woke capitalist version of America that liberals seek to sell progressives on. This is not to say everyone who watches Hamilton is brainwashed into liking the Founding Fathers. For progressive fans of Hamilton, there's a recognition that the Founding Fathers themselves are still very much flawed. They love the musical and its themes and story, and they revel in the associations it draws with modern political movements they support. But most Americans don't share that baseline criticism, and for many of those people who still want to see themselves as liberal-minded, the framing Hamilton provides confers a progressive cachet to the American Revolution that alleviates the guilt associated with our actual history. In preparing for this video, I ended up reading this article by Aja Romano that defends Hamilton from criticisms of historical inaccuracy. The core of their argument is that Hamilton is a fan fiction, and so its purpose is not to retell the history, but to transform it, to reclaim the canon for the fan. While I bulk at most of the content of that essay, I think the core point is true. Hamilton transforms history as we know it into something people of color can see themselves in, and that liberals can see people of color in. And as someone who wants people to be more critical of the Founding Fathers, of the entirety of American history, I really can't help but see this as a bad thing. I'm not convinced seeing this portrayal of the Founding Fathers hasn't affected the way anyone sees the actual historical figures, especially given the degree to which the musical representations are now inexorably tied to them in the minds of so many. Hell, I don't even like the musical, but when I think of Alexander Hamilton, I see Lin-Manuel Miranda at least as much as I see a $10 bill. However, my issue with Hamilton is mainly that the new progressive American mythos it gives us fails in much the same way as the old mythos to acknowledge the issues at the root of our democracy. And in fact, I'm afraid that it's an effective blend of the right kind of criticism and the right revisions made to sell a kind of American exceptionalism to some of the very people who are just starting to criticize it. I'm not saying Hamilton is bad. I'm saying symbols and narratives about our national identity are powerful. Hamilton really was a musical of the Obama administration. It was a time where most people, at least young people who didn't remember the Bush administration in any real detail, could comfortably feel like they could basically trust the system and believe that things would slowly but surely work themselves out. That the system worked and with the right people in charge, we would keep making progress. At the end of the musical, in the face of his impending death, Hamilton remarks that legacy means planting seeds in a garden that you never get to see and refers to America as an unfinished symphony. We, the audience, are supposed to feel as the successors of this history, as members of this new modern America, that it's for us to tend the garden and to add our own notes, to build a better world for generations to come. But these fruits were never for all of us, and I don't think this symphony was ever in the right key. Maybe one day we can take the lessons from our history, our real history, and create something for all of us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are ten things you need to do. Number one. You register to vote and it's on. You post that Hillary sign up on your lawn. Number two. Call some undecideds with your crew. Your cousins in Ohio maybe try and flip them blue. Number three. 
Watch Hillary examine the terrain. Watch a campaign with the man Tim Kaine. Ah, uh, Tim Kaine in the membrane. Tim Kaine in the brain. Now that that's all out of the way, there are a few things I wanted to talk about that didn't have anything to do with the point of my video, so I'm throwing him here at the end. Okay, so first and foremost, I'm kind of over the whole 2015 style feminist media criticism where the merits of a piece of media come down completely to how strong the female characters are. But for a musical that spends so much time building up its progressive bona fides, it's really weird and off-putting the way it portrays its female characters. Firstly, all of the female characters are completely and inexplicably obsessed with Alexander Hamilton. Like, every one of their, you can't really call them character arcs, but whatever, are about him. Like, Angelica seems at least somewhat interesting when she's first introduced, but then everything she talks about is just wanting to be with Hamilton, and how much she loves him, and how she'll never be satisfied without him. And Eliza, they try to make their relationship a focal point of the musical, but with the way they fall in love and how little she seems to do in the story and how her response to the affair is framed, she basically just ends up being this conduit for Hamilton's emotions. The thing I really wanted to talk about, though, is the whole thing with Maria Reynolds. So, like, okay, framing. I had kind of assumed that as a culture, we had more or less moved beyond the whole, like, blaming affairs on the other woman thing, or at least, like, in progressive circles. But the whole thing is really played straight as, like, this harlot seduced Alexander Hamilton in a moment of weakness. And that's not to say that he's not portrayed critically in this situation. Like, it's, you know, he cheats on his wife. That's shown as a bad thing. It, they don't frame him as completely powerless. But it, he's very, like, I don't know how to say no to this. Like, it's like he's being forced by his own, like, not in his control somehow to do it. And, I don't know, there's only so much we can know about an affair that happened hundreds of years ago, and most of the things we do know come from Alexander Hamilton's account of the situation. But when I, you know, think about this and when I see it in the musical and just how it's portrayed, it's like, there's this young woman who comes to a government official for help because she's in a really tight spot, and then she just decides to seduce him, I guess? I don't know, I feel like if an older dude had just taken advantage of a young woman coming to him for help, I would literally expect him to say, she seduced me. It just, I don't know. And then, like, the musical even makes it very clear that her husband has forced her into this situation, and it still frames her as, like, this heaving bosomed seductress to the helpless Alexander Hamilton. I don't know. It just seems kind of sus to me. On a related note, I've been very nice to this musical this whole time, so please don't disregard my whole argument based on what I'm about to say, but do people find the Alexander Hamilton character likable? Leslie Odom Jr. as Aaron Burr? I get it. David Diggs, Thomas Jefferson? So much fun. Like, every other character basically ranges from fine to delightful, but how can a character go around for two and a half hours talking about his top-notch brain and no one talk about how obnoxious he is? Genuinely, there are lines from Alexander Hamilton that can only be described as beyond parody. The problem is I got a lot of brains but no polish. God, I wanted to shove him into a locker. And then every girl in the musical is obsessed with him and everyone else constantly wants to listen to him? Unrealistic. Okay, sorry. I'm done. Wow, you sat through me talking for that long? You must really like me. This is my cat Athena. Anyway, really thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Also, please consider sharing this video if you liked it, especially with Hamilton fans. Big thanks to my friends who helped me edit and refine and sat through all my hand wringing about this script for months, and to At The Nightis for all the help with the set. Also, apparently this guy Christopher Parenti wrote a book about Hamilton from a left perspective that I didn't hear about until after I'd finished recording. His argument is basically that Hamilton had plans for the economy that involved economic planning and shaping by the government, and that the left should co-opt liberals' love of him to forward some progressive economic policy. That would have been way cooler, right? I guess follow me on Twitter, and since you're here, maybe do the YouTube engagement things. Bye!